So I argue in favor of genetically modified foods, I argue in favor of nuclear power, and I argue in favor of at least being ready to use a geoengineering technology. Hi, I'm Ron Bailey with Reason Television. Today on Reason TV, we have uh, Ramez Nam. He is a professional technologist, a former Microsoft executive, and a fellow with the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He's also the author of More Than Human, Embracing the Promise of Biological Enhancement, a wonderful transhumanist book, and the science fiction novel Nexus. Today we're going to talk about his new book, The Infinite Resource, The Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. Welcome. Thanks, Ron. So why did you write The Infinite Resource? I decided several years ago that I needed to understand for myself what I thought the state of the planet and humanity was, and that led to years of research, and that uh, led me to the conclusion that we have serious problems, but that we're capable of fixing them. So what is the chief message you think readers should take away from your book? It's mostly a message of optimism, but okay. it's not a complacent optimism. It's an optimism derived from our ability to solve problems if we act. And what do you mean by act? Well, I think there's several problems that I talk about in the book, climate change right. being chief among them, but also fresh water depletion, ocean overfishing, and so on. So in most of those cases, innovation is really the key to success. There are problems right. where we can end up richer at the other side if we devote our energies to innovating in technology and in economics. How do you solve some of those uh, problems? It seems to me one of the arguments that I, I've been trying to make for many years is that wherever you see an environmental problem of the sort that you're talking about, they're happening in an open access commons. That basically there are defective property rights. No one owns the resource, thereby, thereby everybody over, uh, abuses it and overexploits it. Is that the central problem with these? That is absolutely correct. You also are worried about peak oil, I understand. Why are you worried about peak oil? Well, I know it's no aren't longer- you I'm sorry, aren't you underestimating the inventiveness of uh, people in the fossil fuel industry? Well, I know it's no longer fashionable to worry about peak oil, but uh, we had a series of reports. So last year, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, came out and said, oh my gosh, there's so much oil. When you look at their projections, they projected oil going up at about 0.5% per year in supply, while demand goes up at 2% per year. Uh, and so they saw oil nominal dollars uh, going up to $200 a barrel, about twice what it is today. And the IEA, in their last uh, 10 projections on oil, have been over-optimistic in nine of them. So this is the most optimistic agency you have. Uh, and their projection that people cited in the press as hugely optimistic is actually fairly gloomy. Uh, we haven't reached the top yet. Uh, oil production is going to keep going up, but each barrel is more expensive than the last. You seem to be fairly optimistic about the, once you get the, the property regimes correct or the tax regime correct, you seem very optimistic that the markets should be able to bring forth the innovations to overcome these problems. Why is that? It's what we've done historically in the past. When we passed the Montreal Protocol to phase out CFCs that were damaging the ozone layer, uh, industry protested. Industry took the pessimistic view that this would end economic growth. Uh, there were claims that you would no longer be able to refrigerate medicines and hospitals and so on. And we didn't have a replacement for CFCs. Two years later, we did. So once the economic uh, incentive is there, in this case, you have to keep your business running, people innovate and find new ways to meet that same need uh, with less externalities. So you think that this is a virtuous process that will continue into the future if we get it right? It will, and if you, if you combine that historical view with the technical view of what's actually possible in energy, for instance, in water, in food, you find that just in the basic physical numbers of how much energy there is available, there's a huge supply that we can tap into. So those two things together say, if we make the right choices and the right incentives economically, we can prosper. So now that you have a, a touching faith in the genius of government bureaucrats, <laughs> uh, you advocate, among many other things, uh, to uh, boost along, if you will, or, or boost along uh, technical, uh, technological innovation that we should increase government R&D. Why do you think that government bureaucrats are smart enough to do this and people in the private sector are not? I'm not sure that they are any smarter. I don't think that they are. But there are certain types of research that government R&D can get a higher ROI on than in the private sector. Okay. So for instance, sometimes there is research that has a longer time horizon than most private sector companies have the resources to be able to invest in, for example. And then when you look at a government for investment. For example, give me such a technology. 
Well, I think uh, in solar, actually, a lot of the early work that led to uh, AT&T Bell Labs' mm -hmm. final production of solar photovoltaics came out of the U.S. labs, for instance. Um, and you'll see a lot of the work in battery technologies in the future, for instance, in um, metal air batteries. A lot of that was done by Department of Energy researchers and is now being privatized by private companies to produce those. The other thing I'd say is that the amount that we're talking about spending in government R&D is tiny. So the U.S. in green energy right now spends four to five billion dollars in R&D, okay? That's less than the amount that Americans spend on hair products each year. It's not a very large amount. Bill Gates' proposal is to triple that to 16 billion, at which point it would still not show up on any large scale view of the budget, if you will. That's a tiny, tiny amount, but has incredibly high ROI when done right. In the book, you mentioned that uh, you argue, argue in favor of three different unthinkable technologies. What are those technologies and why are they unthinkable? Yes, so I argue in favor of genetically modified foods, I argue in favor of nuclear power, and I argue in favor of at least being ready to use uh, geoengineering technologies. Um, all of these are sort of environmental uh, bugaboos, if you will, or they're anathema to the environmental movement, but they all have either very real proven benefits or uh, important potential benefits. So with GMOs, the conclusion of every scientific panel that's looked at this uh, the National Academies of Science in the U.S., for instance, is that they're safe for humans and they've actually improved the environment where they're deployed. On the horizon, we have new GMOs that could increase crop yields. And remember, we have to feed 70% uh, more food production is what we need by 2050. So we can increase crop yields. Uh, GMOs that could fertilize themselves from the atmosphere, that are drought resistant, that can grow in saltier areas. Those are all wonderful things for the environment and for people at the same time. Nuclear power, uh, when you look at the environmental consequences of nuclear power versus coal, which is the, the most common form of electricity today, you find that it's, it's orders of magnitude different. Nuclear power over its entire history has killed at most a few thousand people. Air pollution from coal probably kills 100,000 people a year. That's a low estimate right now. In fact, the radiation in the fly ash from a coal plant per kilowatt hour produced is more than the radiation in a nuclear plant of similar size. So it's clear that nuclear is a better technology than one of the old ones we're using. And while solar is wonderful, it doesn't provide a lot of power at night. <laughs> Batteries might get us there, but it's nice to have an alternative as well. Nice to have more than one bet going on as far as technologies we can employ. Uh, and then let's go to climate engineering. You mentioned yes. that as, a, as an unthinkable technology. So, so here's the thing. Right now, it does not look like we're on path for stopping climate change before we reach some danger points. And by danger points, I mean things like the melting of the Arctic sea ice right now is exposing darker waters underneath. That itself helps heat up the planet, and that could liberate a trillion tons of, of greenhouse gases trapped in the Arctic. You mean methane, for example. Exactly. Okay. So we don't want to reach that tipping point, and there's great uncertainty. We don't know exactly when it will happen, so we're sort of just uh, gambling a little bit here. So we need some backup plan. We need some plan of if we're unable to reduce CO2 emissions fast enough, or if some of these tipping points get reached, what can we do? And there's two forms of climate engineering we could employ. One is sucking CO2 out either of the smokestacks of factories or power plants or out of open atmosphere and sequestering it in the ground. That's a good kind of sequestration. Uh, the other is actually reflecting more sunlight into space with aerosols injected high in the atmosphere. And they both could use tremendously more R&D in order to just have them as options and to evaluate whether or not they might be very good options in some cases. You argue that we can buy some, if you will, climate change insurance fairly cheaply. How would we do that? Why, right. why do you say it's cheap? Uh, well, it's cheap in comparison. So right now, uh, worldwide, if you total up every kind of insurance that we buy, life insurance, property insurance, et cetera, et cetera, the world spends almost 7% of its GDP on insurance. That's a tremendous number. It surprised me when I did research for the book. Uh, various people's estimates of how much of global GDP it would take to combat climate change effectively range from 1% to 2%. 
I'd make a case that if you use a revenue neutral uh, carbon tax, the actual impact on GDP is much, much smaller than that. So that's relatively cheap to guard against what is a, a risk of a somewhat unknown timing and severity uh, when it arrives. I mean, we know the climate is warming, but predicting exactly how much it's going to warm and how bad it's going to be when that happens is very difficult. And the worst cases of that are so bad that they are really something that it's worth investing in preventing. So if we do things right, what will the year 2100 look like? It's, it's so tough to look that far in the future. Uh, but I think if you look around the world at what's happening now, you'll see that by 2100, we might have 25 year longer uh, lifespans on average. That's without any breakthrough in biotechnology. That's just the trends. You're looking at uh, a global GDP of close to a quadrillion dollars. You're looking at the poor of the world right. having more richness, more affluence, more wealth than a rich American right yeah. now. I mean, as, a, as an example, say so that today already, a poor person in China, or let's say somebody in the middle in China, has much more wealth in a lot of ways than Rockefeller did. They have cell phones, they have travel options that the richest, the richest people of 1900 certainly did not have. And that's what I think we'll see as well in 2100 relative to right now. Thank you very much. It's been an interesting conversation. Good luck on the book. Thank you, Ron.